you know, I want you all to be in prayer with me because there's so much going on in the nation. And, you know, I'm, I'm so, I'm thinking about the civil rights movement and all of the things that have happened in the past. And I was sharing with my kids, I can't really remember what it was, but I remember when we were children and we all had to go out on the lawn because the Black Panthers were coming through our community. And um, I just remember my grandmother telling all of us, y'all gotta get outside, you gotta get and stand on the lawn. I don't know what that was all about, but I know that there was a threat to our houses being burned down or something like that. And I must've been, I don't know, maybe I was six years old or something. You talking about something over 50 years ago. But these times are unprecedented and it is so important you know, I find myself fighting the tears, just fighting tears and fighting, um, just even getting on my knees and talking to God about what do I pray? How do I pray about what's going on in the world? Because although it's taken all of us by surprise, it didn't take God by surprise. And so he knows what to do. He knows what we need to do to rise up out of this. You know, but one of the things that one of the concerns that I have is how the church is rising against the church. You know, people are attacking uh, church leaders and you ought to be doing more and you know and it's just everybody's pointing the finger at everybody and I it, it really troubles my heart and so I'm just asking you all to be in prayer about it but today is not what we're talking about I just wanted to get that off my chest because it's something that's very heavy in my heart but yesterday we started talking about fear and I used all these synonyms about fear and now more than ever, I think it's appropriate to even be having this conversation because I had to fight a little bit of fear myself, you know, since we've been in all of this stuff that's been going on. And, you know, when you start thinking about fear, it's important to remember what we said yesterday, and that's that God didn't give it to you, you know, and I don't have time to go over everything that we shared yesterday. So I want to encourage those of you that didn't get a chance, go back and watch the video from yesterday. But this morning, I want to get into some other things about fear, and I want to talk about how fear comes to us and the ways that we open our lives to the enemy. And uh, that's important. We know the Second Timothy chapter 1 tells us to put the in remembrance, to stir up the gift of God that's in you. You know, and then verse 7 says, for God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Sometimes we forget the top of that scripture, that we're to stir up the gift of God that's on the inside of us, that was placed on us when hands were laid on us, or when the spirit of God came to live in us. Then it goes into saying, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So the first thing that you can't do is you can't forget that there is a gift that's been imparted to you. And because that gift has been imparted to you, that gift is in you so that you can resist the spirit of fear. That gift is in you so that you can walk in power, so that you can walk in love, so that you can walk in a self-disciplined uh, or a sound mind. And so you got the goods to be able to overcome fear. Yesterday when we finished our um our whatever you call this, our manna, I went outside and my husband and I were digging in the ground and the biggest centipede came up from the ground and my knee jerk reaction was to, you know, to take flight. And my husband said to me, didn't we just address this thing about fear? And now you're going to run. I'm like, oh God, yes, yes, you're right. I'm not going to run from a centipede. I'm not, because that's where it all began for me. That's where I came to realize that I was tolerating fear in my life. And if you recall what I said yesterday, fear to tolerated is faith contaminated. And so fear is a spirit. It's one that God didn't give to us. The word tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. Fear is not good, so it didn't come from God. And so it's important that we understand that the spirit of fear first raised its ugly head at the fall of man in the book of Genesis. Remember when Adam said to God, he said, I was afraid. I heard your voice after he fell. He said, I was in the garden. He said, I was afraid. So I hid myself because I was naked. And so, you know, he stated that, that, that fear came as a result of him taking an allegiance or an alliance with the enemy. When he listened to the devil, and he did what the enemy told him to do. Instead of doing what God told him to do, it opened the door to the devil. And so we understand that fear is an offspring 
of the enemy. And if we allow, it's going to hinder us from possessing and progressing in life. You know, and like I said yesterday, I shared all those different synonyms for fear and I won't get into them again, but fear is it's 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 here to destroy your life. You know, it's an emotion. It's I looked up the definition of fear and it says it's an emotion of alarm or agitation. It's caused by the expectation or the realization of danger. Fear is distress. It's over a real or an imagined threat to your life. And so if you look in the word of God, you'll see that from Genesis to Revelation, you can read God over and over and over consistently saying, fear not, don't be afraid, don't fear, hundreds and hundreds of times throughout the word of God. And so what's happening? God is communicating something to us that we can't afford to miss. The world is full of fear. And right now it's, it's just, it's something to behold. You know, I was, we went to the march on, on Sunday, the, the parts, the march that was put together by the pastors and the, the church leaders. And, you know, when I looked up on the top of the police station that was there, I looked up and I saw all these snipers on top of the buildings. And for the first time now I've been to the Middle East, I've been, you know, I've been where they've carried girls, 18 year old girls carrying weapons that are this long. And I'm not exaggerating, you know, and they're all around me. And I didn't have a sense to fear. I felt peace when I was in the Middle East. But for some reason, when I looked up on the building on Sunday on 6th and Locust or 3rd and Locust, when I looked up on the, the building and saw the snipers on top of the building, an overwhelming sense of fear came on me. And I just began to pray, asking God to bring peace to our nation, peace to our city. And so the world is full of fear. And although we're in the world, John 17, 16 tells us that we're not of the world. And the word of means that we're not with. In other words, although we're in the world, we're not with the world. So as a member, we're members of the kingdom of God. And so we don't view things the way that the world does. And, and through the glasses that the world is looking through, our glasses are the word of God. And so we've been instructed by God not to operate the way that the world does. They live in perpetual fear, fear of the weather, fear of the stock market crashing, fear of recession, fear of being taken advantage of, you know. And so we can't allow ourselves to be moved the way that the rest of the world around us is moved. And I know that that's a difficult thing because what we want to do is we want to live out the word of God in a practical way. We don't want to separate ourselves and be so disconnected from what's going on in the world. But at the same time, you cannot ignore what the word of God says. One of the challenges that I have sometimes with, with church people, and I won't call them church people, I'll call them people who know God, whether they're in the church or out of the church, is that we're quick to say, don't, don't, use, don't use the word of God on me. Don't use scriptures on me. Don't hide behind the scriptures and things like that. And it's like, you all, if I let go of God's word, what's left of me? It's the word of God that makes us who, who we are and tells us who we are. And so when we're bringing God's word into our day-to-day -day lives, that is how God calls or wants us to live. That's how God has positioned us so that we can live successful lives and we can overcome the things that we're experiencing. We, we can overcome racism if all of us would just submit to what God said and love one another. We can overcome uh, the fears of the police if we can get an opportunity and not be afraid to sit down and say what it is that we need to say to them and to say to uh, our elected officials and get legislation passed so that we can push the needle and move things forward. And so we want to move ourselves away from fear so that we can make change in our lives. And so we can't fear what the world fears. It's too inconsistent. You can't look at what the world does. Really, all they see is what the Bible has already foretold. They see that we're in the last days and that was foretold by the prophets of old. And whether they believe in God or not, they see that judgment is coming on people. You know, my son Kyle walked in the house the other day and I could, I could hear it in his throat where he said, mom, what is this? 
what is going on? What is God saying? What is the word of God saying? And I said, Kyle, it's the last days. Luke 21 and 26 says that upon the earth, there will be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. In verse 26, it says men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven and earth shall be shaken. And so you got to notice what the word says. It says that men's hearts will fail them. This is heart attacks, stress, anxiety, worry. People becoming so afraid and so fearfully engrossed in what's going on around them that it causes their hearts to stop beating. You know, and it's that's real. You know, the other day when I was praying about this thing and just the anxiety of it, I could feel it sitting in this area of my body. And I just began to pray and speak to my body and tell my body, you will not carry the anxiety of what's going on. Am I going to work and seek to make a difference? Yes. Am I going to get involved? Yes. Am I going to get to the table where I can make a difference? Yes. But I will not allow the anxiety of all of this. People pressuring me and telling me, you ought to be doing this. You ought to be doing. I'm not going to allow the outside voices to influence me and put stress, additional stress in my life. I had to cast down those imaginations and get rid of that, that pressure that you feel in here. Because what was happening? Fear was aiming at my heart. And so I had to guard my heart. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. And so we are in the world, but we're not with the world. We're not of the world. We don't see things through the same lens that the world sees them. The word of God is my source. The word of God is my life. This is what I'm looking to, whether people like it or not. This is the final authority. And what this says is what we do. How this says is how we operate. And when, when this doesn't say anything, we don't say anything. When this tells us to move out, that's when we move out. And it's not hiding behind it. This is our power. This is our strength. And so it's important for us to understand that the word of God has been given to us so that we can walk and live in victory and not do what the world does when we're in times of crisis. And so it shouldn't surprise us that we're living in the last days. But just as he said there would be wars, then the same verse says that when you, the believer, the body of Christ, see these things happening, this is what he said. He said, when you, the believer, see these things, look up, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. In other words, Christ's time to come and get us out of this mess just got closer. That's what that means. So when you see the word of God is telling you, watch the nations, watch the going and watch. He said, watch Israel and then watch all of the nations around Israel. He said, because that is going to tell you when the son of man is going to be coming back into the earth. And I'm telling you all that all of this upheaval, we're looking at it from the ground level and Christians cannot afford to look at this from the ground level. If you find yourself getting in the midst of everything that's going on, you will not be able to see things from the Christ level. And you have to, as a believer, you wanna see things from a, a higher level where you've been seated with Christ Jesus, looking down, realizing all that we're experiencing is the sign of the times. Does it mean that we don't have a part to play in it? No, it doesn't mean that because we do. But what it does mean is that I'm not to operate as they operate. I'm not to do as they do. And so we don't fear, we rejoice because the word says our redemption is drawing now. Now, so it's like a two-edged sword. I got a sword in one hand where I'm working to bring change to what's going on. But in the other hand, there's a realization that these things have to happen in order for Jesus to come. And so we don't rejoice because bad things are happening in the earth. We rejoice because what's happening proves that the word of God is true and that Jesus Christ is soon to come and get us up out of this mess. I'm ready. I'm telling you, I don't know that there's ever been a time in my life where I felt like looking up to heaven and saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Because there's so much evil in the world. There's so much sin in the world. But where sin does abound, the Bible says grace does much more abound. And so God is looking for stability in his people. He's, he is a stable God and he wants his people to exemplify his nature. Where would the world turn if we're hiding under rocks like they are? Where will they go if, if we're just as 
filled with fear, confusion, and worry as they are. We have to be the light that God has made us. The world has to see that God, God is God and that he's in the church and that we're not afraid of what the devil or what man or what happens in the earth. We stand strong in the power that God has given us. And like David with Goliath, we're gonna stand our ground steadfast, unmovable because God is God and he's with us. And so fear is here to make us unstable. It's here to make us afraid, to make us wishy-washy. It has us up and down and hinders us from helping and achieving great things in our lives and for other people's lives. We've got to make a stand against fear first and foremost so we don't engage from a place of fear. We engage from a place of faith, knowing that God has me, God is with me, and God has the answer. And so it's important for us to understand that fear is learned. It's learned. It's a learned behavior. And although it may have originated with sin and Satan, it's learned. You weren't born in the earth running from spiders. You learn to fear spiders. If you take a baby and sit a baby in, in a room full of spiders, that baby, that baby would just crawl right around those, that room as if nothing was there because it hasn't learned fear. And so when uh, uh, some, something is happening, Fear is often the thing that we don't see. And so I didn't fear centipedes until I walked in the kitchen one day and saw my grandmother standing on top of a chair. When I saw her on chair, I jumped up on a chair. I'm like, what are we, what are we running from? You know, it's like a scary movie. They say all the black people run, you know, in a scary movie and they don't even need to know what they're running from. If somebody, if a group of people running by them, they just gonna start running. Why? Because fear is learned. And so I never even saw the centipede but I trusted my grandmother. And if something was bad enough to get her standing on a chair, you know, I was definitely not gonna be able to deal with it in my mind. So I learned to be afraid. And even though God said in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, that we would be given dominion over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So at creation, you know, we talk about the law of first mention. The law of first mention says that the first time God mentions something in the word of God, that is his original intent for that thing. And so the law of first mention told us, I've given you authority over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, but what am I doing? I'm standing on a chair and I'm running from the creeping things. You gotta arrest that. And so if you don't deal with it at the small level, you'll never be able to deal with it at the higher level. If you can't address the fear that you're feeling over a spider, over a centipede, you can forget about going into another nation, you know, where there's cannibalism or something like that or where going out on to, to, to 26 and Locust or, or, or Martin Luther King and Locust, you can forget about that because God wants you to learn at the small level how to address fear in your life. And so, you know, when we think about behavior, behavior is learned, it comes through our senses. Fear comes through our senses, our eye gates and our ear gates. And so this is why you have to be careful what you watch. You gotta be careful, you gotta be mindful. I don't wanna use that word care. We talked about that yesterday. Yesterday, You gotta be mindful of what you're hearing. When you feed your your, yourself on stuff like Friday the 13th, scary movies, Dead of the Night, uh, what was the name of that movie? Carrie, when she went to prom, well, I can't think of the name of the movie. Carrie, I think it was. You wonder why you're scared to be by yourself and why everything moves you. You know, back in the day, it was movies like Frankenstein and Dracula, Werewolf, and all of that kind of stuff that we would laugh at. But today, what's out here is, is terrifying. When you can see people mutilating other people, but all of it is designed to inflict so much fear in us that it immobilizes us. Satan wants you to think that he's so powerful, that he's all powerful and that he has the ability to do the all that he does in the movies, but he doesn't. Satan's power is only good when you give place to him. And so he doesn't have the ability to move things in your room unless you give faith to it, you know? And he doesn't have the power, he only has that power through fear. You think about this, you know, when you get to the, the scripture in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that we're going to look down in a pit and the question that we're going to ask, is that's him? That's the one that terrorized the nations? That should tell you who, what Satan really is like. 
that all of us are going to look down in a pit and say, that's the one that we were afraid of? That's the one that we were given all this credit to? Yeah. And if you think about it in the book of Genesis, and maybe I'm getting off a little bit, but this is where I feel led to go. You think about it in the book of Genesis. Uh, the Bible said that, that God spoke to the serpent. And he told him, on your belly, you are going to, to go. And you're going to eat the dust of the ground. There's only one thing that gets on its belly and eats the dust of the ground. And it's a worm. And so you think about that. You, you think about that. Now, I could be wrong, but worms eat the dust of the ground. And so here we are running from someone who gives us thoughts, ideas, and suggestions that he's bigger than what he really is and that he has more power in our lives than what he really has. And so we have to arrest this. We have to, we have to uh, understand that God did not give us the spirit of fear. And if God didn't give it to us, I don't have to take this. I don't have to embrace fear in my life. And so we don't want to move our lives into a place where we're constantly thinking about fear because fear is going to have you doing things that you ordinarily would not do. Fear in the mind will have you acting out of things that may not even be true. You're afraid of somebody trying to steal something from you, so you hide it. You think about these children who, who grow up, unfortunately, they grow up and at a time in their lives they have these experiences. And these experiences, you know, some of them have gone without food. And I met a young man who, God had blessed him, but he was raised in the foster care system. And there were times when he was in foster care that he never, the, the, the foster care families did not feed him. So he went to bed hungry. Well, today he's probably making a six or a seven figure salary. And um, his fiance told me that, you know, one day she came home, they were living together. And she said, one day she came home and she found up under the bed, this, this, plastic container that had all this food in it. And she says, she asked him, what is this under the bed for? And he just told her, don't worry about it. What was happening? The fear of going without was dominating his thought life. Now here he's making a six or a seven figure salary, but he, the, the thoughts of fear were dominating his life. And as a result, it had him acting out a particular way, you know? And so you have to be, you gotta be, mindful of fear. You have to arrest those thoughts the moment that they come. I don't care what they, how they come. The moment you start feeling afraid, you grab yourself and say, ah, 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 God did not give this to me. This came from the enemy. And so fear, I denounce you. I renounce you. I do not give you place in my heart, in my mind, in my life. I'm not going to talk about you, but I'm going to speak to you. You have no right to live in my life. You're not going to bombard my mind. I fill my mind with the word of God. God gave me a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a self-disciplined mind. And so my mind is so disciplined that I can take it off of the thought, idea, and suggestion that you are giving to me, and I can place it in a higher place on the word of God. And so I cast down this imagination, the thought that you're going to take my life, the thought that somebody's gonna break in my house, the thought that somebody's gonna kill me, the thought that, that I'm gonna be broke, the thought that I'm never gonna get a decent job, the thought that my business will never take off, the thought that my ministry will never take off, the thought that my marriage is going to fail, that my my kids are going to get on drugs. Whatever that thought, that overwhelming thought might be in your life, cast it down. Don't give place to it. The moment it comes into your mind, bring it down. I remember one time I heard this quote, and I said it to you all before, but it said that a thought that comes that's not articulated will die when it is conceived. It will die at conception if you don't articulate it and if you don't meditate on it. And that's what we want. Every thought that comes to you should not be given birth to in your life. Every thought that comes needs to be looked at. Remember I told you like the meat inspector, we are looking at every, every inch of that thought. And we're asking, are you gonna add to the quality of my life? Or are you gonna take away from the quality of my life? And if you're gonna take away from my quality of life, you cannot stay. You got to go. And in the name of Jesus, I do not receive this. I do not accept this. And so, you know, you, you, I was thinking about Elijah when he ran from Jezebel in first Kings, you know, after God used him in the 18th chapter, 
He worked a powerful thing, killed 400 prophets of Baal. And, you know, God worked in his life and did something really powerful in his life. And then a woman, Jezebel, because he killed all those prophets, one woman came to him and said, by the end of the day, the buzzards are going to be eaten out of your skull. And he ran off and found himself under a, a, a juniper tree, a lone tree, the Bible says, a tree that was isolated off by itself. What happened? His thoughts got a hold of him and he went up under a tree, ran away, went up under a tree. And then when he got up under the tree, he said to God, I'm the only one still serving you. I'm the only one still serving you. All that I've done for you now is having a pity party. And so a woman chased him off with her words. Now he's killed 400 prophets, but one woman said something to him that brought him to his knees. And so what am I saying? You know, you, you keep thinking on something that somebody said, and you know, it's kind of like the, 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 the last straw, one straw. If you've been meditating on fear and you've been having fearful thoughts, it could just take one little thing to tip you over. And that's what happened with Elijah. So deal with the thoughts. Deal with the thoughts, you know, because it's important. It's important that we do what we need to do. I want to tell you all this story. I read this article in the New York Times. It was July 26, 1970. It was an article that was entitled Child's Death in London Laid to Fear of Dentists. And this is where a four year old child had a bad experience with a local anesthetic for stitches that were taken from her forehead from a previous incident. After a short time later, she had to go to a dentist. So she fell, she busted her head and they put stitches on her forehead. And after a short time later, she had to go to the dentist to have some baby teeth extracted. And it's noted that she screamed historically or hysterically rather while she was in the dentist chair. The dentist gave her a sedative to quiet her for the examination. And within a few minutes after having her tooth removed, the child had a heart attack and she was rushed to the hospital where she died two days later. After the autopsy, they found very high levels of adrenaline in her blood system because of the fear that caused her to have a heart attack. So fear of having to repeat what took place when she got her head uh, stitched up was the same fear that came when she had to have her tooth extracted and it caused her death. And so you can see the, 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 the the problems that fear will cause in your life, we've got to address it. Because if we don't address fear, it is going to harm us. It's going to have negative effects and a negative impact in your life. And so I just want to say this to you. you got to cast that down every thought and everything that keeps you out of the plan and the will of God for your life. And fear is the number one culprit. And I'm going to share the story again about my grandmother as I close. I keep telling y'all this and I'm going to tell, tell it until the day I die. I said to my grandmother, mama, why didn't you ever, what did you ever want to do in life? And mama said, I wanted to have my own restaurant. And I said, why didn't you ever do your own restaurant? And mama said, I didn't do my restaurant because I, I was afraid. I thought nobody would help me. I thought it would cost too much. I thought I wouldn't have the money. And I said to mama, I said, you're trying to tell me that you didn't fulfill what was in your heart because you let a thought stop you. You let a thought get in your way. What was the thought? Thoughts of fear, thoughts of failure, thoughts of not making it. And so what I'm saying to you all, don't let fear stop you. Don't let fear stop you. Move forward. If you got to get help to deal with the traumas of your life, do it. But don't give place to fear. Recognize that fear is your enemy. Fear is not a cousin that should be allowed to live in your house. It's not a family member. Get fear out of your house, out of your life, out of your mind, out of your heart, because its mission is to, to, to destroy your life. So God bless you all. I hope I said something today. I know I got off a little bit, but we want to help you all live your best life. I love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.